Welcome to Music Ranch, Montana, here in beautiful Paradise Valley, Montana. I'm your host, Gabe McCauley, and tonight we're going to be having a rather frank conversation <laughs> with a songwriter, an award-winning songwriter, a Grammy-nominated artist, a New York Times bestseller, a filmmaker, a vlogger, a blogger, all the things. But tonight, I don't really care about any of those things, because I'm just going to have a conversation with my friend and neighbor, a true gentleman and a farmer, Rory Feek. <laughs> Thank you. This is where we hear tremendous applause yes. it, had there been more than three people sitting out here. <laughs> yeah. That was a fine intro. Well, I, a gentleman and a farmer. That's yeah. one of my favorite lines to use. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, you and I have gone back quite a ways. I was thinking about it. I, it's pushing 20 years, I think. Yeah, I guess it has been. You think? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's pretty close, for sure. Yeah. I think we first started getting to know one another uh, through a Bible study mm -hmm. on Music Row there in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, at a publishing company with Roger Murrow. Right. Yeah. Yep. You, uh, I, I think, I don't know, were you going there before me or me before you? I just remember uh, getting coffee and a donut and seeing you had a Sundance Film Festival jacket on. Yeah. And uh, I was looking for someone who could make a music video. And that's how our first conversation happened, I think. Yeah. I mean, I was just a volunteer at Sundance, <laughs> but, but I didn't let you know that. You no. were like, oh, well, he must have. I said, I'm looking for someone who could make a music video, a uh, country music video. And I said, I said, is something you could do? And like, sure, I can do that. Yeah. So. So we did. We ended up making a few. Make it a, yeah, we did. Yeah. We made a few. And we're still making them. Yeah. We are. And those, the, it wasn't for you, though, is the funny thing. It wasn't a music video for you or even for Joey at the time. No. You were working with a young man named Blaine Larson. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, my wife and I had only been married a really short time. And uh, it was years and years before we would start singing together. <clears throat> and at the time, I was helping a young man from uh, Seattle area. He was like 15 or 16 years old and a really great country singer. And so we, my buddy Tim Johnson and I were trying to help him begin a career, a music yeah. career, and um, through a series of events, we had been given an opportunity to not only cut some songs on him, to record some songs, but also make a music video or two. And so that's when you came in and, and we made a couple music videos to the songs that we recorded. And he, he was such, I mean, he had a tremendous voice and it was so uh, odd making the video sometimes and watching him because, you know, how old was he? 15 or so? Yeah, he was about 15. His or body did not fit his voice, right? Yeah. I mean, it was just a tremendous deal. Whereas, unlike me, where my body does fit my nasally, <laughs> kind of annoying voice. And just, you see the face, and it's like, yes. This is where I say, yeah. no, it doesn't. No, no. <laughs> but he just, I mean, tremendous depth and whatever. And so we made a couple music videos, shot on film. This was back when you actually used actual film to make yeah. music videos, which was fun for us. And, um, yeah, he had a super powerful song that you wrote. Yes, he had a couple of powerful songs that we recorded at the time. I had never been a producer before. I had written some songs. I would written some hit songs. And I remember being with my buddy Tim Johnson, and I had told him about this young man. His name was Blaine Larson. And, and I had heard about him, and so Tim said, we should record some songs on him. And I said, you know, we're not producers. We're songwriters. And he said something that was pretty profound that I use again and again and again. He said, if we say we're producers, people will believe us. And I, I, I found that, like, is it that easy? And it really kind of was. We took just a very small amount of the money and we went into the recording studio and we recorded songs that we believed in for an artist that we thought had a lot of talent rather than just wish and hope and pray that our songs would somehow find their way to someone uh we we got to play a part in that role and so um the irony is someone gave me that exact same advice for filmmaking so and, and for directing it was wes edwards who's really? a tremendous music video director mm -hmm. and filmmaker there in nashville so if i guarantee any of the music videos you've seen as of late yeah, have yeah. been probably he's done <laughs> at least a few of them and um, he, I was interning at the time for Ruckus Film, 
and he was there, and he was asking me about, you know, what do I want to do, and where do I see myself going? I was like, well, I really want to direct, you know, I think that's, and he's like, well, come back tomorrow with some business cards that say director, hand them out, yeah. there you've done it, you know, yeah. basically that same sort of idea, and so I guess we were both on that <laughs> similar path. You yeah, know? I mean, I think that the key that I've learned uh, over all this time is that if you believe it, right. Others will believe it. That's actually a pretty hard turn to make for yeah. you to allow yourself to believe you could be or you are something. But So we did. We recorded a couple songs. And then what was really unique about that was that we needed a way to market those songs. And so we wanted to make music videos. So we did two things. Actually, your whole team that's here, the majority of them making this right now behind the cameras, they were a part of that back then, too. And... Um, this was another pretty powerful part of that time that's gone on to inform so many other things I've done, and I still do, is we didn't just make a music video way, the way that most people did at the time, and they still do now. We did it at home. It, for us, it wasn't at home in particular. That time, it was, we went to my daughter, Heidi, who's back here. She was about 16 at the time, and we went to her high school, and we shot a music video there. And that was our first time to really do something like that. And it was an interesting choice because we didn't use actors and we didn't use a set. We used our lives and we used the people in our lives. And we did it out of necessity. But what happened was we realized in that moment that even if you didn't have success, you will always have captured these people. I had my children in high school and all of their friends. And mm -hmm. I think, was it your, your grandmother or Mandy's grandmother? Yeah, and grandfather. And, and grandfather. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of us in it captured in time, in a little time capsule. And not only was that a good, like, um, you know, personal move, it translates on film to something mm -hmm. really important. And so... That, that started something that we've never stopped doing. I, I was thinking about that because the next, really after Blaine, the next video we worked on together was Red yeah, Joey's for Joey. Yeah. So this was before you're singing together. It's just her career and sort of the same idea. Even Blaine was in that video, you yeah. know, but it was just, it was literally at your house. It was around, it was in your neighborhood and it was, you just called people, hey, neighbors, we're yeah. shooting a video, come on out, you know, and... Uh, at the time, I probably looked at it as, well, much more necessity, right? <laughs> Just, yeah, well, necessity. But there's no budget, so who else are we going to get? But that has become something you've turned into a brand of authenticity, yeah. you know, where it's now intentional, yeah. you know. Well, Regardless was, of the money's there, we want to make it yeah. true. You know? Yeah, there was someone who came into my life later on uh, who, who explained to me the power of authenticity. And... Um, and how to protect it, and how to make yeah. decisions to protect it, and um, I, we try and do that, you know, still as much as possible. You think you can play one of those songs that you wrote for Blaine? I think so. Um, I, I was thinking about that recently, and um, this particular song came to be because that another guy in that Bible study, that that same Bible study that you and I were in. I met this guy named Jamie Teachner, and he was just a wonderful guy. He was a piano player, and he wanted to write a song, and we talked about it. So one day after Bible study, we just hung around, and we went and sat down with my guitar and his piano. And we said, what should we write? And then my phone rang, and it was a call from Heidi's High School and it was a guidance counselor who said that one of Heidi's best friends, her name was Sam, I think, at the time. Sam, this girl, her boyfriend had committed suicide. And everyone, like, it was a tragedy. It had just happened that they just found him that night or that morning. And Heidi and everybody, was, was, it was traumatizing. And they wanted to let me know. The school was kind of shutting down and everybody was mourning and hurting. And there wasn't anything that could necessarily be done but they were letting parents know that it was going to be a hard thing on the children and all of us to understand. And I, I was processing it, and he heard it on the phone. And him and I were just, I asked some questions. I was like, well, how did, what happened? And nobody knew what happened. And so uh, Jamie and I were talking about it. And 
and um, God did as God does and he just like used that moment and we just ask those questions and um, and this song rolled out and that ended up being a music video that we did that first time we did something together so I, I don't really I haven't done this song in a long time but I'll try It was just another story Printed on the second page Underneath the Tigers football score It said he was only 16 A boy my daughter's age When they found him face down on his bedroom There'll be services on Friday at the Lawrence Funeral Home. Then out on Mooresville Highway, they're going to lay him neath the stone. How do you get that lonely? How do you hurt that bad? Make you make the call And having no life at all Is better than the life that you had How do you feel so empty You want to let it all go How do you get that long And nobody knows Did his girlfriend break up with him? Did he buy or steal that gun? Did he lose a fight with drugs or alcohol? Did his mom and daddy forget To say I love you son? Did no one see the writing on the wall? Hey, I'm not blaming anybody We all do the best we can I know hindsight's 2020, But I still don't understand How do you get that lonely? How do you hurt that bad? To make you make the call Having no life at all Is better than the life that you had How do you feel so empty? You want to let it all How do you get that lonely and nobody knows? It was just another story printed on the second page underneath the Tigers football score. I remember when we made that video, we decided to let that story, to let Blaine's voice just live for themselves as best as possible. And so we, we didn't tell a story or anything with it. It's just him in black and white, just singing, you yeah. know, just performing. And I thought it turned out great. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, it was so powerful at the time. Um, and once I started believing and my buddy Tim started believing that we were producers and we felt like we had... You know, it was it was a strange combination. It wasn't uh, Blaine had also that that boy uh, had lost a really close friend through suicide in his hometown at his school, and so he could relate to it. But it was a strange combination to have um, a 16-year-old boy 
singing about suicide of a teenage, and it was from his, it wasn't, it was really from his perspective the way that we did it, about something that was happening, you know, in his world, and it was so real and so honest. And then you also had, he was kind of, um, just a very innocent person. And when he, we did that music video, I remember he uh, borrowed his stepdad's jacket, like a um, dress coat. And it was too big for him. And it was perfect. And we knew it was perfect. Yeah. And it just looked like a million bucks. We all thought we were looking at Elvis. Yeah. Just something so authentic, you didn't really know what to do with it. And in a number of months or weeks, actually, um, big record labels came calling um, Renee Bell and Joe Galante at RCA, and and uh, they upstreamed it, and it just it took off like wildfire. Um, with the exception of one thing, um, they wanted to remake the music video, and where we spent almost no money, it was just all of us. It was Jeremy and um, Joel and all of us together. And, uh, they they wanted to you know use an un, ungodly amount of money <laughs> and go hire a bunch of people. I mean, I would have let them. Yeah, we would have if we'd actually, had it. That would have been yeah. great. But they went and hired all these people and they shot it in a place, in a set, in a yeah. make believe situation, and it was okay. Um, and it did real well. Yeah. But it wasn't the same thing, and I knew it, and we all knew it. Uh, we just didn't know how to protect it mm. and champion it all the way through yet. Um, but that was kind of a good lesson learned for us. I heard another voice and another guitar while you were playing there. You, you have some accompaniment with you this evening. I do. I have I we um, least... my oldest daughter, Heidi. You might have to go over there. They disappeared. But... And, um, and there's and her husband, Dylan. And uh, they're going to sing uh, if, you know, whatever we're doing. Uh, they don't know that song, or Dylan in particular doesn't know that song. <laughs> but you did a great job, Dylan. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I also have another accompaniment. You want to come out here by your sister, Indy Boone? <clears throat> Indy's here just in case we decide to break into um, a Frozen song or something yeah. from um, Cinderella. She's here just in case. Yeah. Well, you never know. Never know. The night is young. Good job, guys. We'll see you next song. So this is uh, a lot of what we've been talking about is, is pre-duet. You know, this is, this is your career as a songwriter. And so even when we made that music video for Joey Red that we were talking about, that's her as a solo artist. Yeah. Yeah. So was your intention... Um, early on to also become an artist, you know, or had you always strove to just be a songwriter? How did that work? When I first moved to Nashville, um, I think I had visions. Well, when I first made a trip or two to Nashville, I had visions of being an artist, mostly because I was always writing songs and I didn't really know there was, there was a job for songwriting. So I thought, that those were the same, you know, this, the singers wrote their songs. And then I actually, while I was still living in Dallas, I had heard some songwriters, uh, some really great songwriters, Jim Rushing, um, Al uh, Alan Chamblin, Austin Cunningham, and Alex Harvey came and did a show in like a Ramada Inn. And I said in the audience, I happened to be there, and I'd never seen songwriters perform before. And I knew in that moment, like, that's what I'm supposed to be. And I went home... And in a moment, I packed my, I was a single father, two, they were still really young, maybe, you know, uh, seven and nine or something like that at the time. I packed the kids up, and we moved to Nashville 100% really to be a songwriter because I saw it. I knew that's what I was going to be. And so all of those years um, later, I, I never thought really about being an artist. Um, I still don't really think about being an artist and even the Blaine Larson story, it's a funny thing. The guy who ends up giving us the money, um, that time, the reason that we had money, because I wouldn't normally have money to make a music video back then, but I was playing a show at Puckett's, which was the early Puckett's way out in Leaper's Fork, and I was just doing a songwriter show. The kids were still fairly young. I think maybe we had just got our um, 
we'd been in the farmhouse maybe a year or something. And I sang a song that I had written called Bible in a Belt that was at the time, and even more so now, very politically incorrect, I think. But it was what I felt. And anyway, I was singing that song, and a lady came up afterward, and she said, could you come to the table? I want you to meet somebody. And, and the guy's name was John Burns, and he used to be a big, big deal in the di music distribution world. And he said, you should be an artist, and you should make a music video, and you should record that song, and I can sell it. I think he knew that it was, it was something that was reactive and it wouldn't be for everybody, but the people it would be for would react. My immediate response was, that's really nice, but you should hear my wife and you should hear this kid who's 16. Mm -hmm. And I completely deflected it and I brought Blaine Larson into John's office mm -hmm. and we went down that road. And I've pretty much spent my whole career doing that. It's taken a very long time for me to be okay with being here and being here not in support, you know, in support of, like I'm a songwriter writing songs for other people. So it's still unusual for me. But I think God's been, you know, he's been just pushing me in the spotlight yeah. for years and years. What about growing up as a child? What was your aspiration? Was it to be a star, to be a singer? I was, my father wanted to be a singer. My father... Um, I think Jimmy Fortune mentioned the other the other day. He was talking about, I think it was he was talking about, put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. My father sounded almost identical to Jim Reeves. He was really uh, he was tall and handsome and and very charismatic, and he had a really great voice. He played with a he played a guitar with a thumb and a finger pick, and he had a particular old school style. And he didn't know a lot of songs, but the ones that he knew, he sang really, really well. And he dreamed of moving to Nashville and being a singer. And it just never happened. And uh, so he had always worked on the railroad and passed away, you know, fairly young. But his dream became my dream. I just, I don't know why. I just somehow, I just said, I'm going to do that. Not that I thought I was good at it. I just thought that seemed like a worthy goal. And so... Um, by the time I was in ninth grade, I had taught myself to play guitar, mostly Jim Croce songs and Don, from a Don Williams songbook and a Jim Croce songbook. And I was playing in talent contest and, um, and then all the way through the time I was in the service till I got out of the service and, you know, and then finally moved to Nashville. I was always going down that road, headed to Nashville, however I could get there and whatever I was I was supposed to do. I just didn't know there was any other option than, than singing. I feel like you've always had a good way of, um, we, you know, you, we've talked a lot about you, you've had a rough upbringing, you know, and so this is probably, was probably something very good for you to aspire to become, pull yourself out of where you are, you know, and to achieve something um, more and but, but you've had such a great um, ability to just turn and shiv shift and pivot wherever mm -hmm. you feel like God is opening another door closing another door and so well yeah I'm a songwriter but maybe I need to also be singing here for a moment or maybe this is for my wife or for this other person or who knows what's next so yeah it's been fun to watch H how do you how do you deal with that the pivoting <laughs> yeah and how do you um is it ever disappointing or is it always uh um, exciting you know i think when i was younger <clears throat> in my 20s maybe even early 30s um, my daughter heidi and i talked about this a lot um it took a long time for me to understand that the best way for me to live was to have very high hopes but very low expectations mm. because what would happen is I would get my heart broken and I would get uh, depressed or just so disappointed because I had I'd run way ahead of God or way ahead of wherever I was and then I could see it it's like it's going to go this way and so th those were some hard times but over time like your heart being broke you being disappointed when you w wouldn't do that and you would kind of like give it up and you'd say, well, I wonder if this is going to head that way or if it's just a, a stepping stone to go somewhere else. 
once I started seeing the fruit of that and I started to uh, realize that not holding too tightly onto something, instead realizing this thing may be, may be actually going somewhere else, uh, I started uh, being in, so encouraged by it that I, it became a habit. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really deeply yeah. ingrained in me now. But I think early on it was probably something that, yeah, was hard for me. Um, but it, it's something I just had to work at. I still have to work at. Well, let's jump back to that songwriter show. Uh -huh. There you are in Nashville. You'd never been to something like that before. And in a moment, you knew that's you. Yeah. That's what you're here for. Yeah. That's what you're going to do. And so when did you land your first hit? How did that work? Well, it's, it's funny, again, mentioning Heidi. Uh, I remember in that moment, in that show, Austin Cunningham, who I've become good friends with, Austin wrote, there were, there were these guys writing, uh, the singing their songs. They were hit songs, some of them. Some had a bunch of hit songs. Some had one. But they all had great songs, and they were very personal songs, and they also had this rapport with each other. Like, you could tell they're friends, not just friends on the bar stools singing. They're friends, and they have a life together, and they're dreaming together, and they're sharing. And um, anyway... I remember uh, Austin singing some songs that I had never heard and I've never heard recorded since then. But I remember the songs, like one was, because Heidi's a flower farmer, um, he had a song called Gladiolas. Um, I think it was called Gladi something about Gladiolas. And it was just this vision of this old lady that he would go and see and, and, uh, and she, she just uh, had a green thumb and... And, and also, like, love grew all around her. And, and I, I, it felt like a movie was playing in my head. Not just a movie that I wanted to watch, but a movie I wanted to live. Like, that felt like a life I wanted to move towards. A picket fence, a farmhouse, uh, you know, growing something. Even though it was only in a song, it was a vision of something that I... I think I needed to hear it in a song to pull me at it. And um, so I started writing songs that way and trying to think about where I was going and, and writing stories that way. And so anyway, um, in time, I've, when I moved to Nashville, I moved in 94, um, the fall of 94, right before school started for Heidi and Hopi. And... Um, I was trying to survive, and I, I made it for like five, five or six months sort of surviving. We lived in a little apartment, and then we had to move back to Texas, where, is where I was living at the time, because we couldn't make it. And, um, and so we moved back for six months, and then I came back in the fall of 95, right before the kids' school year, and I've never left. Um, and somewhere around that time, I got a publishing deal with Harlan Howard, and he was one of the most famous country songwriters of all time still. Um, just record-breaking songwriter. Well, so how does that work? You must have been writing some good songs for someone to take notice. You just walk in and say, hey. Well, you know, I'm a fan. Sign me up. I'm a fan of, uh, I don't know when this happened, but I, I'm a fan of great stories. So that doesn't mean I just want to write a great story or sing a great story. Like, I'm a fan of great stories that we're living. I didn't know yet what that was, but um, God was giving me these crazy stories and opportunities. So I, I was in Nashville, and I was trying to make some meetings, and somebody would tell me about somebody else. Earl Thomas Conley's brother is over here, and there's this publishing company called Criterion, and somebody knows. Anyway, I got dropped off one. Well, I, I had heard uh, this, someone, a friend of ours, had said that Harlan Howard, who's a real legendary songwriter, was going to be at the Sunset Grill. He goes to Sunset Grill, you know, on whatever it was, Friday nights at 1, one o'clock or Friday afternoons. He's going to be there. And I, you know, I, I just couldn't believe that. And so this friend of mine and I went and we sat down in bar stools in the bar of <laughs> Sunset. And we just waited. Yeah. And about 2 o'clock came, 2.30 came, and finally the bartender's like, hold on, he's going to be here. And he comes in, and he sits right next to me. And I couldn't believe it. And he just break, breaks into a conversation and starts talking to me. 
And, and it was the greatest, it was one of those, all right, if I have to move back home tomorrow, it's okay. This was a really good day. We were drinking a lot. And he was holding court, as I would learn later on, he's really famous for. And by the time the evening's over, he has 30 people around him, and he's just been telling stories. And it's, it's been the greatest night, you know, evening ever. And he looks over at me, and I was pretty out of it. But he looked, I, was out, I was still there enough for him to know when he said, you know, I have a publishing company right <laughs> over there. He said, you seem like a good kid. I could use a young songwriter. Why don't you come see me sometime? And then he left. The next morning, somebody, a friend dropped me off on Music Row, on the other end of Music Row. And I knocked on the door. I was supposed to have a meeting. And I think I gave him about 10 seconds. They didn't answer the door. So I took off with my guitar, walking the other direction. And I kept walking and walking until, I mean, it's a long way. It's like 10 blocks or something. I kept walking until I felt like I was positioned myself to where he was pointing. This is Sunset Grill over there. It must be here somewhere. And I found a gardener who was outside, somebody who was working on sprinklers or something. And I said, is Harlan Howard's office somewhere? And he said, yeah, it's the next one over. So I buzzed the thing, and the lady lets me in. And I said, hey, I was with Harlan last night, and Mr. Howard invited me to come see him and maybe play him some songs. And she said, oh, honey, <laughs> Har you know, Mr. Howard says that all the time. He's very busy. I'm sorry. He has no time to see you. And I was crushed. I was like, oh, no, he didn't mean it. And I start to leave, and I go into the lobby, and he hears me. And he's in his, like, beautiful wood-grained office. And he calls me in, and I walk in, and he's sitting there eating a bowl of chili with his, his socks uh, up on his desk. <laughs> and he says, uh, sit down. And he signed me to a publishing deal that lasted five years. Changed my life. He basically snuck in backstage. Yeah, I, uh, that's, that's I always say I, I stalked my way into yeah. a publishing deal. Wow. But it was such a, you know, it, it I didn't that. realize that, you know, I could have done it a different way. I could have, I could have probably worked my way. But, you know, God was sort of teaching me, you know, that's not a good story. Here's a good story. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, it was pretty neat. And I was writing for him for about three years. We had a publishing deal where I made um, $300 a week, and we lived in a little apartment. I would come home every night, and uh, I would play the new songs I wrote for Heidi and Hopi. And, and then I would put them in their bunk beds, and we would say a prayer, hoping, and hoping that one day one of those songs would... Uh, would get recorded, and then one day one did. And um, the first song I ever had recorded was called Someone You Used to Know. And Colin Ray recorded it, and uh, it ended up being a single, and then a big number one song, and it's how we ended up buying the farmhouse, is that one song. Can we hear it? Sure. I think so. I ain't gonna lie to you and say it didn't hurt to see you with someone new and you were wearing my old blue shirt but it didn't kill me until we said hello and I became someone you used to know Like a friend, like a fool Like some guy you knew in school Hey, didn't we love, didn't we share Or don't you even care I know we said we were through but I never knew how quickly I would go From someone you love to someone you used to know I 
Bet you didn't tell him about those weekends at the coast Or how we used to argue about who loved to the most Well I guess I won that one Cause I still need you so But to you I'm just Someone you used to know Like a friend Like a fool Like some guy you knew in school Hey, didn't we love? Didn't we share? Or don't you even care? I know we said we were through, but I never knew how quickly I would go from someone you love to someone you used to know. I'm not someone you love, I'm someone you used to know. Thank you. Was that a pretty pivotal moment? It was pivotal for a bunch of reasons. I went from being um, no one to uh, someone, sort of. Uh, I think I still, that was a tough time because I thought at the time, uh, whatever angst, emptiness, struggles I had, you know, when I had a number one party and all your dreams had come true and your family is driven in from everywhere, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm over the moon. It yeah. couldn't get any better. And um, it was pivotal because in that moment I realized that's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I was actually probably more unhappy at that time than I've ever been. Not musically, because I was thrilled and it did change my life in lots of ways, but... It was, a, it was a definite lesson that uh, if you're not happy where you are and with very little, you are not going to be happy with more. Yeah. And um, so, but that, uh, you know, I, I, at the time I had a 56 Chevy. I moved to Nashville in a 56 Chevy Bel Air, an old, really kind of junky one, but me and the kids drove it. It was our family car. And uh, when I had a number one song, this was in... 1998, I think, 97, 98. The first thing I did is I bought a brand new 1958 Cadillac mm. <laughs> for uh, $6,000. And uh, I thought I was, I was high rolling. And I also bought this old farmhouse. So Yeah. Yeah, it was neat. Hmm. Well, you're looking awfully Montana out here. And you too, sir. Yeah. Yeah, this is my wife's scarf. Uh, years ago... We went to Wyoming uh, for this retreat to the ranch thing that we played, and um, she taught me how to, at least back then, she taught me how to tie some version of this thing. And so I was like, yeah, well, let's just... Joey gave me this one as well. Yeah, yeah. I know she did. Yeah. It's pretty amazing out here, is it not? I think there were very few men in her life that she felt comfortable giving <laughs> the vibrant... Uh, uh, what color is that exactly? I, I was going to say pink, but I think it's beyond pink. Yeah, the yeah. fuchsia. I love it, fuchsia. Things. Fuchsia. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it out here, and you and, you and I have both been out here uh, many years now. Yeah, you like. know. It's um, becoming a habit. I'm out here because of you. You're out here because of me. Yeah. We're yeah. out here because of Frank, yeah. the man who owns this, that, that came to be because... We made a television show together at home yeah. again, like just we had no idea what we were really doing. We all just said, yeah, we can make TV shows. And um, somewhere in the first or second season, Frank invited us to come out here and perform to just do a show. And we decided to bring cameras, much like today. And um, we fell in love not only with the place, but the family who owns this and all the people who work here. They're like us. They have very little turnover. The people who were there then are still here. Yeah. And that's the way it is back home. Most of us are still in, in the same lives. So here we are. That yeah. was in 2013, so seven years later, I think, maybe. I think that was when we were here first. 
Uh, it's been six-ish years, I think, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Joey loved this lifestyle, the cowboy life. You know, I don't know if that was so much you initially at first, but I think it's grown on you. And yeah. you definitely had a lot of um, farm upbringing, but this cowboy way of life is a whole, whole other thing, these ranchers out here. I didn't have either. I had a trailer upbringing. Yeah. I, um, I always like to say that, you know, we grew up on the good side of the trailer park. And we really did. Um, it's funny how life works because you think the trailer park is the bottom or some bottom. But my mother took a lot of pride in the fact that we lived on the good side of the trailer park, not like the trash on the other side. <laughs> and so it, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was kind of a neat upbringing because I, didn't, uh, I did have a few moments when I was in fourth and fifth and sixth grade uh, just for like two and a half years my parents were trying to work things out, and they moved us to a little town called Highland, Kansas. And they moved into a farmhouse for one of those years, because we moved every couple of months my whole life until I was grown. And then I joined the service, and I moved every couple of months for the <laughs> next eight years. But uh, during this time, we were in a farmhouse in Kansas. And I don't know what it was, but not just me, but all four of my brothers and sisters it's the greatest moment of our life. Like we, it's where we wish we could have stayed and lived. And um, that was my only farm upbringing as I'm on a little piece of, you know, a farmhouse surrounded by cornfields and um, a little creek with a bunch of bullhead fish down there that we could, like it was just a little paradise for a very small amount of time. And it wasn't until many, many years later that um, really uh, just a couple of years ago that I realized as I had this, farmhouse and in a whole different world that we live in now and I don't even know why I made those choices why I didn't move into a cul-de-sac or a gated community or whatever that a lot of singers or songwriters do but I realized that uh, a lot of us spend our whole lives trying to recreate our favorite m moment from our childhood hmm. subconsciously we don't know yeah. we're doing it we're just we're, we're headed down a path subconsciously, and I think that's what was happening. So uh, I took a shot when we bought this old house, uh, when I had that song as a big hit song. I bought this super rundown old farmhouse and a little bit of land out there, and I moved my children there, and, you know, we had no, it was, you know, we were washing clothes, I mean, washing dishes in the garden hose. It was a disaster. It was the worst decision in the world. And my kids paid the price because it was, it was not a, it was tough um, compared to Indy now grows up in a pretty beautiful farmhouse. Uh, but at the time it was very, very difficult. And um, something told me that, that there was value there. It was going to be hard, but maybe it would be, this house could be a home that could create a life probably something that uh, that my moving around didn't have and in you know subconsciously my kids had been in apartments and you know wherever we were living and so I think maybe I was trying to provide something for my children that I didn't have and um, and then when Joey came along Joey actually grew up in a farmhouse and so this place was a disaster still at the time that I met her which was in I bought it in 1999, and she came into my life in the fall of 2001. And I remember when she drove to the farmhouse, uh, I just knew she was going to pull up, and I was, she was going to go, see you later. <laughs> and I'm telling you, she stood there and saw this place that was just run down, and she goes, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I thought, what in the world is happening? And she did. She saw it. She knew it. Um, it reminded her of what she lived in and what she loved. Um, but as far as the cowboy world, my wife worked. She had a horse, a couple of horses when she was a little girl and teenager. And then she worked her young adult life at a horse vet clinic. And she loved horses and she loved cowboy lifestyle. And she was a ca complete cowgirl. She drove a truck with a dog in the back. She wore, you know, 
uh, Justin boots and Wrangler pants, and she just, she was just, she was awesome. I'd never seen anything like her. She was like a creature from another planet, really hot creature from another <laughs> planet. And uh, anyway, uh, I, was, I told somebody this story the other day, because my wife was also very practical. We now have horses that we got right before Joey passed away, just because I wanted her to experience them again. But we never did. We never, even though we had some room, our life just didn't. She, she wouldn't do anything unless she could do it well. She knew horses took a lot of work. And uh, she could, we couldn't provide for it. And she didn't have, we didn't have infrastructure or anything like that. <clears throat> but we were on a plane one time after our music career had done. We'd been doing really, really well. And I know you know this documentary. Her and I were sitting on a plane sharing iPod or Air AirPods. And we were watching the documentary, um, oh, what's the, the trainer's Buck. name? Buck. Yeah, about Buck Brenneman. And, and she was watching, and it was, it was so good. It was so, so, so good. And this is at the height of our career. It couldn't go any bigger. Like, she's done everything, and she literally, like, she just sobbed. You know, she just sobbed crying. But she... Closed the laptop. She said, I think I might have missed my calling. I'm like, you're super well known. You, you didn't miss your calling. But she, there was something in this Western culture that called for her that she never really fulfilled. And the few times that we would come out here, she could feel it. Yeah. And uh, like uh, Jimmy Fortune's wife, Nina, we would get here and, and she would start looking at real estate. <laughs> Just yeah. a little bit. She was she was too. Well, um, I know she always to wanted that. to do a month long cattle drive oh, out yeah, here and just in. Um, yeah. And she played a few good cowboy songs. She played a good yeah. She played some cowboy songs. Yeah, some cowgirl songs. Yeah. Do you have any of those you could play for us? The the setting is appropriate. <clears throat> um, I know one cowboy song. It's not my song. Um, I've only played this a couple times, but I love this song. I love, uh, you're the same way, like I love authentic things. I love authentic people and places and this was a song I heard a long time ago and, and so uh, I'll try it. Pushing horns weren't easy like the movie said it was. And I don't recall no dance hall girls or hotel rooms with rugs. We worked hot and tired and nasty, rode our ponies head too low. And there was all the nights we couldn't sleep, cause it was too damn cold. And we'd sing Strawberry Roan and a Little Joan. Like the time we hit the river and the rain began to fall And the water was rising so damn fast we thought it drown us all We lost a lot of steers that day and four or five good mounts But when all the boys rode into camp we knew that's what counts and we'd sing Bringing in the sheaves and the rugged crows Well, the lightning struck behind us And it took us by surprise And I whistled out to Bonner I seen the terror in his eyes And he rode for all his horse could ride and I know he done his best But he crossed over Jordan Riding Dunny to his death Still singing Bringing in the sheaves And the rugged cross
if you see the cowboy, he's not ragged by his choice. He never meant to bow them legs or put that gravel in his voice. He's just chasing what he really loves and what's burning in his soul. Wishing to God that he'd been born a hundred years ago, still singing Strawberry Roan and a Little Joe. Who, where did you first hear that song? Uh, it was a cut on a Garth Brooks record. Um, I don't, I don't even know what record. I don't know. I just, I listened to it a lot of times, and I just loved what it had to say. And uh, yeah, I love that song. I don't know who wrote it. I, I don't, I don't know. Mm. Hope he doesn't mind me singing it. <laughs> oh, we didn't. So. <laughs> I think the rest of the internet felt pretty good about it too. The internet. Yeah. So, these days, 2020, been kind of a funny year, but I think you and I have talked about it a lot, and, and there's been a lot of good for us, you know, a lot of opportunity for change in our life that isn't usually afforded by our busyness, you know, or by, by the normalness. And so I feel like you've amped your farm game up quite a bit this year. You've, you've really became the gentleman and the farmer, right? So it seems like you've spent a, a lot of time uh, learning from Joel Salatin. It's true. Yeah. Um, so this is the first time, you know, I, we live on a farm. We've lived on a farm for 20 years. And we've always had a garden, and we've always uh, messed around. We've had a few chickens and had eggs, and Joey actually a few times learning from Joel and watching YouTube videos. We've harvested chickens a number of years. But I would say, you know, our farm is a place where we live. It's not a farm that's alive. And this, this year, one of my goals was before COVID or any of these things came around, I knew like when January came, it was like, I want to go down a different path. I want to, I want the farm to come, to come to life. And so we just started rethinking everything. We took out most of the fence lines that were there. And um, we started thinking about how can we start putting some of these things in place that we've talked about for lots of, lots of years. How could we get pigs and start raising our own pigs? How can we get cows and why and where would we do it and what's, what spot and how would we do it and all those kind of things. And so we, we just started down that path and uh, that happened right around the same time that everyone started being quarantined. And uh, my family, I, I live on a farm and just over the last 10 years or so, the farm has grown a little bit bigger. We have about 100 acres. And on one side of our farmhouse, my sister Marcy lives. And on the other side, my sister Candy lives. And I found myself on the porch. And for the first time, my sisters and brother-in-laws and my niece and nephew, they all were asking the same question. They, they were saying, what happens if we run out of meat in the grocery store? There is no more eggs at Kroger right now. And the things that my wife had been doing as a hobby, for her it wasn't a hobby, but I'd say everybody else would have looked at it like, well, that's nice. That's nice you put some stuff up. You know, God knows how much time that takes. You could just run to Kroger and get it. Uh, those things that were nice ideas all of a sudden became real to not just me. It wasn't just an idea that I had. It became important. And that was a real gift from all of this stuff. Now. I have, a, you know, my, my family is alive on the farm. Like my brother-in-law is, like he's just, he, he's just running all over the place. He's, while I was here just the other day, he sent me a picture. He poured a little concrete slab so that we can build a big compost um, pile that we can manage. And, 
and then um, just one thing after another after another we're just working on it and my niece and nephew made the trip to Joel's last weekend to learn from him and yeah so the farm has come to life and I love it I feel like it's what I I've been leading to and uh, it's just making our life richer for sure yeah. We, you and I talk about it all the time. Yeah. We're surrounded by us and everyone. You know, if you think about a tribe in your tribe, or my, my tribe is not singers. Mm. I'm not surrounded by other musicians. I'm surrounded by people. All my friends are people who really just want to homestead. They might not be able to. They might live in town in Columbia or, um, you know, in a duplex. But they're thinking about it. They're working on it. They're watching and reading and we're all, we all feel the same way, and we're trying to step into it as best we can. And so it's been fun. Yeah. I love being able to go to, over to your place now and see the pigs and the cows yeah. and chicken, lots of chickens, lots of chickens. I mean, lots. you really amped it up this year. <laughs> you went from just a couple little things here and there to, like, full-blown, full, full blown, and that garden's looking good. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Well, th that feels like a, a song. That, that Joey very much cared about, and that was sung um, at the end of every Joey and Rory episode. So, do you think you could play that for us That's right now? Like weird fly. Yeah, there's a little. Well, can he, you know. Can you, and with magic, bring him over to your side for a minute? Just sure. So um, yeah. I. Uh, and, and that this is a song that she wanted to write, correct? I mean, this was. No, my wife had never, Joey had never written a song before, and she, she didn't really ever think about writing a song. It's just that when I met her, I knew she had something to say. She had something to sing, and she had it like where I might be able to sit down, and I was pretty good with words. She had a real um, uh, instrument, you know, when she sat down in the room, her voice was, an, was a real instrument that changed everything. She also had a really strong opinion, like she... She knew who she was, and that was very unusual. Most of the time, if I sit down with men or women and we sit down to write a song, they really only had one, one thing on their mind, and that's like, what will sell? Mm. What will make us you know, a lot of money or what yeah. will get us a record deal? My wife was a little different than that. Although she did want those things to happen, she really liked the idea of singing about the things that were important to her, so... Um, me and that same guy, Tim Johnson, that uh, had done the Blaine Larson project with me and actually co-wrote that first big hit song that I had, we sat in a little office uh, right after Joey and I had gotten married and um, we were going to try and write a song with Joey. And I was trying to get a sense of the things that were important to Joey, mostly to inform what we might write about. But as we were making the list, the list felt like it wanted to be the song. And, um, and so that song unfolded that day. That was the first song that we ever wrote together. And it ended up being very important for a lot of reasons. It was, uh, it was uh, the uh, theme that we closed every episode of our TV show. But it also rooted, it rooted everything. You know, we could, we could sing about fun things and silly things, but at the heart of us, that song is what our lives were about. It's really what her life was about, and it's what my life was going to become. Um, those things that were important to her became things that are important to me. And a, an awful lot of them are important to our children now. So, you me sing that? Yeah. Not planning our day around the TV set Paying our bills and staying out of debt That's important to me That's important to me Opening the windows and letting in air Holding hands when we're saying a prayer That's important to me that's important to me Having somebody to share my life Being a husband and loving my wife The 
very best father I can be. That's important to me. Planting a garden and watching it grow. Keeping it country on the radio. That's important to me. That's important to me. Telling the truth and being real. Feeding my family a home cooked meal. That's important to me. That's important to me. Always having you to hold. Being beside you when we grow old. They plant us neat that big old tree. Believing our dreams will take us somewhere. Still being ourselves if we ever get there, that's important to me. That's important to me. That was important to her. And that's important to me. So that rounded out every episode of the Joey and Rory show. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just finished another TV show. <clears throat> I and did. It's, it's airing now on RFD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, this is a. Uh, it's it's interesting being back here this summer. Um, I'll go back to that song in particular. So, in the uh, summer of 2015, I think for the first time after the first time we had ever been here. So it would be the second time we were booked here. I think it was, something like that. <clears throat> we were booked to play in October, or sorry, in August of somewhere around that time out here in uh, 2015. And my wife couldn't make the trip because she was really sick. And so Heidi and I had to make the trip here ourselves. And... Uh, wow, that was really difficult for me because I had no idea what to do because, you know, we were artists together and Joey sang that song and she sang the majority of the songs and but people had paid to see us and they understood that she couldn't be there. But I didn't understand and I knew we were about done because Joey's sickness had gotten worse and worse and so <clears throat> um, a couple things happened. One is I got up on stage and I was trying to figure out how to sing those songs because they were about her. And I think I tried to sing That's Important to Me. And it was, it was not that it was emotional, although it was emotional. It just was wrong. It was just wrong. I just couldn't figure it out. Like, no, it was the wrong key, the wrong words. I, did, I just couldn't figure it out. And that's what it felt like the whole time. But it didn't really matter. I just wanted to fulfill you know, our obligation. And then I remember that night, just a little side note is the next day, I think, or right after that, they were having a, a fundraiser here for someone local and they were giving away, they were raising money for someone who had cancer here. And I knew Joey and I were done singing. So I, uh, I said, well, I'm going to leave my guitar. And this was a real special guitar. This had been in our life for a long time. And it was what we had been on the original TV show and stuff. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave it and let them auction it. And so I signed it. We left it here, and they auctioned it off. And I just knew I was done singing. It wouldn't matter anymore. I wouldn't need it. And uh, after Joey passed away, a year and a half or so after that, when I finally to start, decided to start singing again, um, long story short, the guitar showed up back at my house at the very first concert I played. And it was because, yes, it was sold to raise a bunch of money, but Frank, who owns the ranch, is the one who paid for it, and he brought it back to me. And so I've had the guitar ever since. Well, so a couple of years ago, we came back and I sang here, uh, me and Heidi and Dylan. And then last summer I was here and we were performing. But even though Joey had been gone for three and a half years, I was not me. You know, like I couldn't figure out what my place was. I, I was just... Uh, 
we, you know, I was just, it was Joey and Rory minus Joey. Yeah. And I just couldn't find my, I just, in life, you know, I was, I was doing okay, but in particular, creatively, I couldn't find my place or anything else. I just, I, I just knew it. Like I wasn't moving forward and maybe I wasn't supposed to, but it was here. While I was here for a few weeks, I found it. You know, I was, wasn't, was really more about I made a decision while I was here. And I've told you about this. Frank doesn't even know this. But while I was here, I decided in that moment I'm going to make a new television show. It was, you know, it was basically the same thing. I'm going to be a producer. I'm going to make a television show. I'm going to go home and figure out how to do it. And it's going to be about our lives and we'll follow our lives. And because of that, a chain reaction happened. And so we did make a television show this year called uh, This Life I Live, and it just finished the first season and, and you know, maybe the only season, who knows. But uh, it was an amazing year, but it also opened a bunch of other doors and other things that have happened. It's created, um, it's created, um, yeah, I got a job uh, being the head of creative for a TV network at the same time. I've been making other TV shows. And I've found my own footing as a, you know, you know, it's, it's one thing. Yeah. Joey and I were on a TV show called um, Can You Duet? And uh, we, we were, that's what launched our career. And it turns out we could duet. And uh, it was amazing. But it's been a while for me to figure out, can you solo? <laughs> and because of my time yeah. here, the quiet time at the ranch last year, it gave me enough courage and... Um, and clarity to say yes. And then now it's a year later, and so even though that's still Joey's song, it's mine too, you know, because yeah. it isn't that I have to just sing about her values. They really can be mine too. And uh, that's been a long time coming on. So yeah, I made a TV show this year. And you didn't just say yes. I mean, you said yes <clears throat> big time to whatever was going to be happening because you had a huge year. All hell broke loose when I said yes. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah really. I mean, four or five different TV shows you're working on, and then you're like, oh, in the midst of this, why don't I get on YouTube and start yeah. vlogging every day? And, and just you've been, you've been busy. And then we opened yeah. a, an office called an, Red King, a production right. studio. Another restaurant. A, another restaurant we opened. <laughs> And then we, uh, yeah. you know, we have a working farm now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been an amazing year, but it feels like natural progression. It feels yeah. like when you're ready, life will start beginning yeah. again. And, and, I, and I was ready. And so it's been really special to be out here now again, just to review the year and yeah. think about where is God going with this? And, and is it time to pivot? Right. You know, and, and so even while we're here, this is, this is us. We were, gonna, we were all going to sing on the stage to no one. And we decided, and Frank let us pivot at the last minute and say, what if we have conversations with songs instead? We just do something we haven't done before. Yeah. And it's been real special to me. So what have you learned over this last year of staying very busy and creating these shows and becoming, you know, working with networks? Are, are you ready to con keep that up and continue that? Or do you, if you could wake up every day and do the one thing that you love, what would it be right now? Um, that's a good question. You know, I'm, I'm a funny person because I'm, I'm pretty fine with like not doing anything, which is being completely, I, I could just take the next six months off and mm -hmm. just uh, bush hog. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I know me, I would create, but I wouldn't aggressively create. Yeah. I can do that, but I can also, I can go real far. You know, I can be really, yeah. really creative and do what is, what seems like too much, but I'm surrounded by a lot of people, so they, they help make it happen. Um, am I... Am I ready? What was your question? Am I well? If you could wake up every day right now, what what's inside of you? What's calling you? I know we've had a couple of different talks about <clears throat> some things that have been on your mind, and how even education has become something yeah. that's sort of sh showing up that maybe you never expected with the schoolhouse. And I really do think that uh, I have been waking up every day doing what I want to do. I really do feel like yeah. that. Um, it, you know, a month from now, it could be a little bit different what that 
it's 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 fluid in the sense of sometimes God opens this door and he's walking down this path and then it starts to close and then you're pivoting and heading somewhere else. There are some things that are on my heart that are a little bit different and one is education. We have a one-room schoolhouse at our farm and um, at the same time, I am very new, like I'm the most non-political, uh, I, I don't know anything about anything. Uh, I just don't. I don't take sides on anything, but I am interested. There, there's a reason that I feel the way I do. I mean, I, I am someone who I'm a big fan of, in my own life, personal responsibility, and, and I feel like that's really important to me. Um, but as I learn more things and I surround myself by more people, I, I used to think, wouldn't it be great to make a dent in the music industry? And then I think, wouldn't it be great to make a dent in the film or video industry or television industry? And now I just find myself thinking, wouldn't it be great to make a dent in people's lives? Period. Hmm. And, and that's a different thing. Like, that means, that means everything. That, so our one-room schoolhouse... You know, I care deeply about not just the little kids that are there, but also um, the kids who aren't there and about the education system as I've got to experiment with our own school and our own rules. It makes me think, hmm, I wonder, if, I wonder if it's a model that you could share on a larger scale with other people um, and, and give an option that's out there. So there's... So that's something that I'm, I was just telling them uh, one of the things we're considering doing is uh, going live with the schoolhouse mm -hmm. where every morning uh, at 8 a.m. when our school bell rings, it also rings on Facebook and other places and providing a one-room schoolhouse the whole world can fit in so that while we're teaching our little ones, as it's so confusing that's out there, Lots of children can't go to school right now, and parents are very confused about should they send their children to school, and, and how are they going to work? Like, it's so, so complicated, and I just found, found myself thinking, wouldn't it be nice if you could take some of these skills that we have and put them into a need that's out there? So, yeah, I'm, I, I want to get involved in that part um, in school. I, I want to help, help do some other things, not just on that part, but I want to help... I want to help um, teach the kids. I want to be there more. I don't just want to be a father who drops off my little one and then comes back at lunchtime. I, I'd like to play a larger role if I can. Well, you've written several children's books. Mm -hmm. And uh, are, are you active now at the school? Uh, I know you said would like to do more, but the things you're doing there now, reading to the kids and things like that. I'm active. Yeah. Um, I've tried really hard because... It's a, it's a beautiful schoolhouse, and it's a farm school. And, but I, I've tried really hard to n not be too active because I wanted Miss Rebecca, to, who runs the school, to run the school and have autonomy. And I could just say, whatever you think. Like, I trust you. If you have a question, I'll be glad to help if there's anything I can help with. But I've, wa I've wanted to do that because I, I felt like it was important but now um, I feel like she could probably use some help. And I also wonder, this is a pivot sort of thing, I wonder sometimes if you try something you've never tried before, something that scares you a little bit, um, you could be, I'm 55, it could be that you could open a door, you could, you could find out, wow, that's the most exciting day that I've ever spent, uh, rather mm -hmm. than just being there and helping and reading. Uh, that's yeah. one thing. It's another thing to say, I'm going to go and try and teach the kids something that isn't in the books, and I'm going to spend the day with them with a particular plan in mind. So I'm just wondering if it could also be really good for me. So I, yeah. I don't know yet. We're working on that. Yeah. Well, we have a few questions from the viewers here on Facebook, so I'm going to try and um, pop a few of those off. Um, so if you're streaming us online, feel free to submit some questions, and we'll try and, um, try and see if we can get Roy to answer some good ones here. A lot of people are wondering, 
about the concerts that you used to have in the barn. Do you foresee continuing to do those, or what's that? Look well, like? no, I, I don't. I don't force. I mean, yes, I, I have a like Frank. I have a concert hall in my driveway. It's there for a reason. Like we're yeah. going to do more concerts and we're going to do other things, but I don't know when. You know, it's. It's. I was kind of excited about canceling all the concerts, um, mostly because it uh, it opens opportunity for something to be dif something different. And so, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know. Maybe we'll start up in September. Maybe we'll start up in November. Maybe we won't start till next year. I don't know, but I'm sure we will start back up. We'll do more concerts, but I don't know what. Will we change something? I don't know. It's just an opportunity to really look at it. Well, there's a handful of questions that I'm going to tell the viewers. They have to go back and watch the entire live stream to, to get the answer because we've already answered them. Okay. So um, who signed your guitar? I did. And, yeah, go back and watch. Uh, is the, guitar, the guitarist Heidi's husband? Yeah, go back and watch. Yeah. He, she, he is, <laughs> yes. Um, this is just to get more views. Yeah, oh, great. Just, yeah, yeah. Um, here's an interesting one. Have you ever entertained elderly? Being elderly? Have I ever entertained that? I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, what you're have, you, have, about. have you entertained becoming old? <laughs> yes. Have I ever wow. entertained older audiences? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't know if you've come to my concert. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, some of, you know, some singers, they're the girls thereafter are in their 20s and 30s. That over 60 crowd, that's the ladies I'm looking for. Yeah. You come to our concert, there's, there's a, lot yeah. of, a lot of people that are older at our shows and wherever we go. Well, here's, a, here's a good one. Do you still write songs for other artists? No. Yeah. It's not that I don't write songs for other artists. It's that I don't write songs. I've just stopped, you know, a number of years ago, really when Indiana was born, she's six now. And I haven't really written, I haven't wanted to write. I still don't really want to write. I, Heidi and Dylan are making a new album and we were over in the lodge the other day and, and we entertained the idea of writing mostly because I just wanted, I just want to help them. And I, you know, we, we had 15 minutes. I wasn't very, I wasn't any help. But um, I don't know, you know, I, I feel like the, the season that I'm in, you know, every episode of a TV show that we make is a song. I mean, it's a song. It has a beginning and an end and a story and an arc and a point and a purpose and a subtext. All of it is going on. And I don't have to hope that George Strait or Tim McGraw will record it. I can share it on the mom in the moment, and I don't have to wonder, does anyone care about it? Like, I care about it, and that's all. And so the things that I make, whether it's a flog, some three-minute thing that I do at home, or a children's book, they're all really just songs. I mean, I'm a songwriter, so I create from the mind of a songwriter. So whatever it is I'm making, I'm, I'm really just probably fashioning them around the structure of a songwriter. But no, I'm not writing songs. Maybe someday. <clears throat> I don't know. What's a song that you could play for us right now that's speaking to you and your life right now? Well, okay. I can tell you one that's speaking to me right now. Um... Um, a lot of people are very afraid right now. And I can understand why. Um, change is difficult, and um, there's a lot of unknowns. But uh, over the years, I've come to realize that some of these, you know, the good stuff. Uh, there's a phrase that I came across years ago, and, and the phrase is, all the good fruit is out on a limb. And I came to realize that what that meant was we are all sort of at the bottom of the tree wanting an extraordinary life and wanting amazing things in our life, amazing stories, amazing journeys, amazing adventures, amazing home life, amazing marriages. 
And um, everybody's standing there in that safe place wanting that. But there's no fruit because it's all picked. There's millions of people there just wanting it. You have got to shimmy up that tree by yourself and pick a limb and start heading out on it. And if you get way out on a limb and it's very, very scary, there's a few things that are true. Number one, you might fall. But you're, da- you're dangerously close to the good fruit. And that's where the good fruit is. And so I just have, you know, I've done that in my life a lot. I've thought about it a lot, that the good fruit is out on a limb. And I've, I've tried to visualize that the point is, is it's going to be scary, but it's so worth it. And once you do it, you, uh, and you see the fruit of the fruit, you do it again. Yeah. And then again, and then again, and then... <clears throat> You get to where I'm sitting right here, and now you just want to tell somebody about it. Jarvis is the corner man where the golden gloves train. The sport's long passed him by, but his love for it remains. He was something in his younger days. The best in these parts had the tools of a champion. But he never had the heart Now he always wonders what if Each night he locks up that gym And regrets that he never left the trunk And went out on a limb Sarah teaches voice where she used to attend. She sings in Sunday choir and at weddings for friends. She had dreams of Broadway from such an early age. But she settled for a small town life and minimum wage. Now she always wonders what if When she sings her Sunday hymns And regrets that she never left the trunk And went out on a limb We walk this way but once We get no second spin Looking back on all you've done Will you wonder what might have been? Rachel is the girl On which Richard's heart was set He struggled for the right words each time their eyes met He spent hours in the mirror Rehearsing what to say Convinced himself each night That tomorrow would be the day Now he always wonders what if Each morning she wakes with him what life would be had he never left the trunk and went out on a limb. Philip Coleman wrote that song. When did you first hear that? Oh, early on when I was in Nashville, um, writing long before I ever bought the farmhouse, I, I met this guy, actually he's a friend of Paul Overstreet's before he was my friend, I think, named Philip Coleman, and uh, Philip played that song for me, something he wrote by himself that uh, no one has ever really recorded or cared much about, and I just always loved it, and so 
um, I sing it now. One of the questions people are asking is, have you ever thought about doing like a songwriter's workshop? I, I know we've talked about you doing a life workshop. Yeah. I mean, I've thought about it. You know, in the concert hall, I actually went up, up to um, my wife's hometown of Alexandria, Indiana, a couple of years ago. And Gloria Gaither does a, a workshop there, a symposium, and me and some other songwriters uh, spoke and taught for two days there. And I've done some things through the years with NSAI, but um, I have thought about doing something at our farmhouse uh, for writing songs. Uh, but I've just never really pulled the trigger to do it. I, I mean, there's reasons probably, but I mean, I might somewhere down the line, but I, uh, I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem right. Not, I think you're also right. required to do it in just wonderful places, you know, yeah. like maybe like the here? Bahamas or here, or, here, or yeah. you know. <clears throat> yeah, we should, we should yeah. definitely. That's different. Yeah. That's different <laughs> now. That's a whole different thing. Here in Montana, yeah, that would be fun. Right. So what do we have in store tomorrow? So we're kind of getting a little workshop tomorrow of some sort. We're getting a, another frank conversation. Yes. Uh, we're going to uh, sit down. I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to be you. Yeah. Again, just pinch and then, your I, nasal. And then this chair will, will be a Joel Salatin. So I will have a conversation with really one of my wife's heroes before she was mine. And, um, and then I've got to spend a lot of time, you know, for me, a considerable amount of time compared to what I thought I might be able to spend with Joel. And um, I became aware of him through farming and, you know, ra uh, harvesting chickens and raising uh, animals and things like that. But then uh, jo Joey and I actually took a trip to Virginia with our bus driver, Russell, years and years ago. We were such big fans of Joel's. We had bought all of his books and read them. And there were some tremendous things that he's really just talking about, like family-friendly farming. But every, every page I turned, I just saw my own life. I saw the music business. I saw um, value, a value system that he has in place that made sense. Like there were things that I was doing, but I didn't know, or Joey and I were doing, that I didn't know why we were doing. And so anyway, we, we were playing in Virginia on the other side of Virginia, and we thought, surely it can't be that far. So we headed across the Blue Ridge or wherever it was, and we pulled in on a Sunday to his farm and uh, parked. And Russell had driven all night, so he just slept in the bus. And Joey and I walked down the driveway, and we just went to Joel's house. We didn't go in the house, but we walked all over his farm, which is very unusual. But Joel specifically has told everyone, his farm's open. He wants you to see, I mean, unless that's changed, his farm is open. He wants you to see what he does. And even on a Sunday, it probably wasn't unusual for him just to see people walking through the pasture, taking pictures of his portable you know, chicken tractors and all the things that are going on. And Joey and I were just walking around dreaming about a day when we could do this at our place. And, you know, and we, we might have been like wondering, is he going to walk out the door at any moment? And we could say hi to him. Uh, and it didn't happen. We didn't meet again for, we didn't really meet until last summer. He invited me to come to his farm. And my, I spent Joey and I's anniversary weekend with Joel and Teresa staying in their house. And it, it was so, so special. Anyway, um, so tomorrow we're going to get to have a conversation with him. And I, I, um, I'm still fairly new to the space that he is in. We, he's he's well-known, sought-after speaker. I think the next place he goes from here is Sweden. Um, and he travels all over the world. And um, But... The things, you know, the things that Joel has in place at his farm, they're rooted in so many other things, you know. It's, it's, a, it's all <clears throat> down deeper, deeper, deeper. So I'm looking forward to that conversation because it will be that. But I, I'd also, just on a personal level, I've, I've got a lot of questions. You know, I'm still growing and learning like, like everybody else. And he's a master. So we're yeah. going to have a master class tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're running, we're running out of time, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's a frank conversation, so that means I think uh, we can be frank with our time and 
Yeah. Stretch it here and there, but I'd love to hear another song or two. Sure. Before we close things out, is there something else that's been on your well heart or mind lately? Um, Indy, come over here. Come right here. If Papa plays a song, will you dance? Okay, come on over here. Come over here by Papa. Maybe you can dance right here by me. And me and, me and your big sister and your brother-in-law. That's weird. She's six and she has a brother-in-law. Right? That's, that's what Dylan is? Brother-in-law? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. We'll play something Indiana can dance to. She has been so good sitting over there all evening long. I'm going to go up one more, Dylan. Um, you want to dance right here, Indy Boone? All right, this song's for you. Do you know why this song's for you? Because when your big sister, both your big sisters, Heidi and Hopi, were little, that, this song is about when they were little and Papa had to drive around in a minivan. And I had to trade my motorcycle when Papa was cool, which was a long time ago. <laughs> and my Firebird, which you don't know what that is, but it's cool. I trade them in for a Ford Aerostar. And that's not cool. And now, all these years later, I get to do it again with you. And it's a blessing. So this is for you, Annie Boone. You gonna dance? You got your cowgirl boots on and your cowgirl dress. Let's go. Sitting at a red light Down around sunset Girl Girl took up beside me In a candy apple red Corvette She pulled down her shades and Gave me a wink Gave her a little smile back Then she laughed as she hit the gas And I remember where I was at It's hard to be cool When you're behind the wheel of a Eight passenger automobile in a big bubble cruising down the street with a Barney blaring and a baby seat. It can be done, but I'm telling you, man, it's hard to be cool in a minivan. I used to have a souped up hot rod, man, I spared no cost. 283, four on the floor, headers and dual exhaust. About the time the family came, well, that's the first thing that went. The preacher said, for better or worse, now I know what he meant. Cause it's hard to be cool when you're behind the wheel of an eight-passenger automobile in a big bubble cruising down the street with Barney blaring and a baby seat. It can be done, but I'm telling you, man, it's hard to be cool in a minivan. Come on, Dylan. I wouldn't change my life a bit. I'm a lucky man, I know. Just wish my wife and kids could fit in a 67 GTO. Cause it's hard to be cool when you're behind the wheel of an eight passenger automobile in a big bubble cruising down the street with Barney Blair and a baby seat. Hey, it can be done, but I'm telling you, man, it's hard to be cool in a minivan. Come on, boys, can I hear an amen? It's hard to be cool in a minivan. Good job. Good job. Woo! I didn't think we were going to close with that one. We don't have to. No, we can. No, no, no. We, 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 we should uh, keep going. Okay, let's keep yeah, going. Keep going. Uh, a couple more questions. These seem very important. Is... The, your bus driver single. <laughs> that could, you know. Are you, uh, well, you have to ask his girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. It's better. <laughs> uh, no, I, well, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. How to, I don't. He's wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Um, <laughs> 
some inquiring minds are still wanting to know about the schoolhouse and um, if it's a bit more like a homeschool setting, a public school setting, maybe just a little bit more about that. The actual home, the, the schoolhouse? Yeah, the school. <clears throat> it's a homeschool because it's a school at home. Um, we built a one-room schoolhouse uh, at our farm and they had the kids have their own garden greenhouse they you know they have their own animals they have their own chickens uh, this year they will have meat birds and um, also egg layers they have a canning cellar you know all, all that sort of stuff so it's you know they're little they're kindergarten first yeah. and second grade but we're sort of teaching them sustainable living along with ABCs yeah. you know we we call it the four R's reading writing arithmetic and all things rural so, but how we're doing it is um, there's a maximum uh, capacity really for us. We don't want any more than 15 children. So we're treating it like a homeschool family. It's no different than um, Dr. Theron and his family who are here. They have eight children that they homeschool. So they use a, a homeschool curriculum um, so they can teach multi-age. And so it's the same thing. Rebecca, the teacher, has selected a homeschool curriculum. So we go through that with the children. But we also teach them all kinds of things and, and expose them to things that they would never get in a school. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of homeschool meets, it's, it's actually technically uh, a private Christian school. So just it has to fall in a category so that you can make your own decisions, and that's, that's the category. Yeah. And the, the kids spend a lot of time outside. Yeah, they spend a lot of time outside. Actually, we tried. If we would have been able to, we would have. Uh, um, our plan was when uh, everybody went on quarantine, we didn't really want to stop the school. So we moved the teacher and all the kids' desk to the greenhouse. And we thought, we'll just have school in the greenhouse every day because they're outside and fresh air. And, you know, ultimately, we, we didn't, they didn't give us that option. But, uh, yeah, they're outside a ton. Yeah. Do you think you may be a new type of Mr. Rogers? That's not on there, right? That's on there. <laughs> That's so weird. Do you know how much I hear that? I knew you'd love that question. <laughs> I mean, I hear that so much. Um, yeah, that ain't a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. I mean, when I was... It's we could a, all be that's Fred a, That's been a funny thing, because you and I talk about this. Yeah. Because when you are young, there is nothing less cool than Mr. Rogers. There's nothing more square in the world than Mr. Rogers. But as you get older and your value systems change, you see someone like that. We've watched together. We've watched like his congressional hearing where he's talking about the value of television for children. And just, just not television for children, just, just what he's trying to do and what we should all be trying to do. And then he wins a Lifetime Emmy Award. And, and he, the things that he says, it's, it's crazy. It's like his value system was so strong and against everything else, you realize that he's not square. He is so cutting edge, it's ridiculous. Every, all his choices, everything that he did. But he was also a very calming voice to the children and to the world. And I think people say that to me a lot. People tell me, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's in my voice or I don't know what that is, but I, I hear that a lot and I, I take it as a compliment but it isn't, it's a funny thing because that isn't because of my songs and my singing. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's come because of something else, you know, because that's only come since Joey passed away. And, and as you move into new things and you're telling stories differently. And so I think about it a lot and I think about, you know, what does that mean? Why, why did someone send that question in? Hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I feel fairly certain I'm, I'm just as ridiculous as Mr. Rogers in the sense of, like, um, I, I go my own path. But I don't know what that means, but I take it as a compliment. Have I, what was the question, do I, could I be? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what that is. Yeah. It, it, it'd be a nice dream, that's yeah. for sure. I think that'd be an amazing thing if you could be that. Did you hear about what recently happened in Colombia with the billboard? I did. Yeah. yeah tell that story. Well, I'm not sure if I'll get it correct, but uh, there, was, there was a billboard that's been up there in Colombia for quite some time about uh, an enhancement for 
women. Yes. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, a pretty, popular billboard. It is. It's, it's eye-catching. It is eye-catching. And uh, some folks decided, well, what if we just pulled together some money from the community to replace that billboard? And, um, well, what would we put on there? We, there's, there ought to be something good, right, that we could put on that billboard instead of what has maybe caused many wrecks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so they decided to just put a Fred Rogers quote. Yeah. And they, they raised the money like in 15 minutes, and I think they raised enough to keep the billboard going, and they might That's just so alternate great. quotes. And I, I can't that. remember ex the exact quote, but um, That's so cool. just pick any. You know, yeah. That's they, a start. Great. Yeah. That's a great start. Well, as we round out our evening, what song could you um, perform for us here that feels right to close the evening out? Uh, and the, probably the most important choice would be to ask Frank what he would like for me to sing. I think you're right. Frank, do you have a request, sir? Or Karen? Karen, well, that's, that's basically the question. <laughs> Frank turns to Karen. Karen chooses the song. I sing the song for Karen. <laughs> Bible and a belt. Oh, wow. Bringing it back. Okay. Full circle. Bible and a belt it is. <clears throat> well, here's the funny thing. To, to bring it back full circle. Um, I, I told you this story, um, this story that um, how uh, this man or this lady says, you, you know, I played this song years ago, and this guy said, you're an artist, you know, you, you should sing this song, and I just deflected it. I mean, that's, that's in 2001, that's, that's almost 20 years ago, 2002, and uh, God has somehow keep like nudging me into the spotlight. He pulled me into Joey's spotlight. Somehow I got in there and I never thought that would happen. And then when she, when she stepped out of the spotlight and it was still going on, I didn't expect it to go on. Like I just felt like that light would just go out and I would just be at home and life would just resume like it was 15 years before. I just, I, I expected it to completely go out and it didn't. And it just got brighter in some ways, different, but brighter in some ways. And it's been hard for me because I didn't really want to do that. I didn't, you know, it's been hard for me to step forward on my own and find my own place and, and even just feel okay. You know, it's challenging. So one of the very difficult things for me was I was completely against trying out for this television show. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I was a guy who had been wearing overalls for 15 years. I was 42 years old. I'd seen enough reality shows to know. I know how this works. Um, I'm going to be in the outtake of the first episode, and I'm going to be the butt of a joke, and I'm going to be humiliated for the rest of my life. And it was my worst fear. Mm. I mean, it was just, Joey knew this, and uh, it was my worst fear. Well, it didn't work out that way. It ended up um, we got opened a door for us to travel all over the world and sing and for me to be with her and us to, to share some amazing things. <clears throat> so he, I, he just kept doing that through all those years. And then, um, when Joey was gone, it's hard for me to stay in, to stay here, you know, even though I appreciated it, I didn't feel like it was mine. I felt a little ashamed of, I didn't even want to be here, and now I'm here. And uh, anyway, through a series of events, I've kind of come to realize. And there's this year, this story years ago that I've told it a lot. That when it happened at the Bluebird Cafe, when I met Joey, or actually I didn't even meet her, but she had seen me play at the Bluebird Cafe. And I always told the story one way, and the way was this. So I was at the Bluebird Cafe, and there's this beautiful girl, and she sees me sing, because and, and, she told me the story. And she knew in that moment, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, and, and we have, and we did. But the way that I saw it unfold was somehow God knew that we were not only going to have a great marriage, but five years later, he was going to put us in the spotlight together. He knew that. And she knew all that in a moment. And like, how crazy is that? Like that, but that's the end of the story. 
But this year, as I mentioned, this sort of change for me to step forward is try and to, and to kind of get permission to be okay without her being here, talking into a microphone. Um, I, I came to realize that the story might be different and that it might be that uh, God has been working and he's still working and that that day that I saw that day that I saw my wife, I saw Joey, um, I thought somehow God knew I was supposed to help her become her, help her dreams come true, all of them, including having a baby that she didn't even know she had yet, um, every bit of it. I thought that that's what that meant. And I've always felt that way. But this year, I've come to realize that, you know, maybe there's another part, too. And that part is, I wondered if now to give, you know, that's sort of given me permission is, what if part of it was God told her in that whispering in his ear, not only was I going to help her, but she was going to help me in a way that, I thought I was a songwriter, and all I dreamed of and wanted to do was to write a hit song and sit in that, sit in that bar stool and write a hit song, and that maybe, just maybe, God knew that he had bigger plans for me. I was going to tell stories in totally different ways, and there's other things he needed and he wants me to do, and I wasn't going to get there by myself, and she, she, she one of her reasons was she was going to take me from there, that bar stool, to this one. And uh, that's a game changer for me. It gives me permission to think that uh, it's okay. And this song, all of it. So... They were both made of leather, both black and frayed and worn. And I was brought up to respect them since the day that I was born. One came here from England, and it's been handed down for years. The other one was ordered from a catalog at Sears. Well, one my mama read to me till I was well up in my teens. And I thought all the other one was for was to hold up daddy's jeans. Till I told a lie and learned it had another purpose too. And out behind the shed, my daddy said, this will hurt me more than you. One had my daddy's name on it, the other said King James. With a love they taught us lessons, but we feared them both the same. One led us to heaven, and the other left to wealth. But those were the days when kids were raised with the Bible and a belt. I remember when I was 12, I stole a dime store comic book. And how Mama read where the scripture said to take back what I took. When I refused, my daddy grabbed my arm and said, come on. I needed more he knew than just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, sometimes it made me cry. Sometimes they made me fight mad. And I'd wish I'd been raised without them like some other children had. 
But now I'm grown with kids of my own And I know just how they felt And you know it seems to me What the world still needs Is a Bible and a bell Cause one had my daddy's name on it The other said King James With love they taught us lessons But we feared them both the same one led us to heaven and the other hurt like hell but those were the days when kids were raised with a bible and a belt a bible Thank you, Rory Feek, for being here with me this evening, having this very frank conversation. <laughs> and thank you, Music Ranch Montana, uh, for hosting us in beautiful Paradise Valley, for the team putting this on this evening, Lil Dragon, uh, Joel, Jeremy, Nick, Lee, uh, Adam, and thanks, Dylan and Heidi, for coming along and Indy backing up Rory here tonight. We had a great, great evening. All right, that's our time for this evening. Thanks for watching. Thanks, kid.